speaking with, uh, there was, uh, this happens more often than not, but there was a, a couple that needed counseling. Guess who showed up? The wife. And uh, in talking about um, what, uh, again, just opening up with her, what a godly marriage is. And she says, you know, I've never really heard this before. Uh, I, what you're describing here, I've never, it's never been taught to me. I don't know anything about it. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Well, that's a, that's a very sad thing. And that means we need to do a lot better job in our churches today of teaching about and helping husbands and wives understand who God calls them to be. Let's just start with this. Now, ladies, be honest. When you start hearing, oh my, he's going to talk about submission. How many of you just don't care for that? Anybody? Wow. You ladies are doing good then. Praise the Lord. Uh, this tells us, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, let me just go ahead and say, this passage cannot be understood outside of how marriage relates to Jesus Christ and his church. That is the pattern for marriage. The relationship between the, <coughs> excuse me, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the groom, the bridegroom, and the church, who is the bride. That is how we are to understand what marriage is to be about. So again, wives are told to submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife. There's a key word, head. As also Christ is head of the church. Now, some people try to take this verse and do a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, uh, oh my, I had a word on my tongue and it just left me. But try to do a little bit of twisting here because they come back to the verse that precedes it, which says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of, of God. And they say, aha, submitting to one another. That's what marriage is about. That kind of counteracts this whole wives submit to your husbands kind of thing. But the pattern here is Christ and the church. So if for marriage, so if we say, well, this is this mutual submission thing, then we say, well, Christ submits to the church and the church submits to Christ. I'm sorry, that doesn't fit. Christ does not submit to the church. We submit to him. But again, let me just say, I've known some husbands who took this thing and totally butchered it because they understood this text to basically say, my wife needs to be to do exactly what I say. The moment I say it, the moment I call for it, if I expect dinner to be ready at five o'clock, it dang well better be ready at five o'clock. If I expect the children to be in bed, I expect never to have to change a diaper. I expect never to have to wash a dish. I expect never to have that she's going to take care of all this stuff because I was raised old school and that's the way we do it. I'm, well, you can tell as a counselor, I'm pretty tough on husbands. Because guys, we need to grow up, we need to stand up, and we need to be the man that God calls us to be. And the first one I'm preaching to is myself. This is not, submission is not, wife, when I say jump, you ask how high. That is not what this is. We are talking about headship. And headship means somebody has to be willing to take the lead. Headship means somebody has to be willing to make the hard choices. Headship means somebody has to be willing to make the sacrifices necessary. You want to know how Jesus Christ showed headship? He, in the upper room, he took off his outer garments, he dressed himself as a slave, and he washed his disciples' feet. To the point that they said, Master, what are you doing? Peter even said, you can't do this to me. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And then Peter said, well, Lord, just give me that. And Peter, Jesus said, just the Peter, it's good. But again, that's how Jesus showed what headship is. He served. He said, I'm among you as one who serves. So again, when that is what it means that the wife submits to the husband, she submits to his headship. She desires his headship. It says, just as the church is submit, subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, notice, did you notice the proportion of how much is said to wives and then how much is said to husbands? 
quite a bit more. But again, let me, let me just qualify this. Sometimes we balk at the subject of submission, but the Bible defines this. Look, skip with me down to verse 33. It says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So wives, I'm going to stick with you for just a moment. What God calls you to do, how we might really say what submission to your husband means, means that you respect him. That you respect him. Now I'm going to define how this looks in the counseling room for a moment. But let me just speak about this. This comes into sharper focus when we, when we talk about it this way. The, how many of you would lift your hand and say amen to the fact that a husband is to love his wife unconditionally? Amen. A husband is to love his wife without condition. How many of you would be as quick to say amen to the fact that a wife is supposed to respect her husband amen. unconditionally? Very good. A wife is supposed to respect. Now, here's how respect looks in the counseling room. Basically, respect means to have, have, hold in honor. To hold in, in high regard, to appreciate, to like. Well, here's how respect comes about for a lot of wives. She's like, well, I love my husband, but I don't respect him because I see how he acts. I see what he does. I've seen it for 30 plus years. You know, I, I, do you respect a grown up two year old? I, I mean, that's this is what I get told, folks. Um, you know, it's like, I love him, but do I like who he is? No. Well, folk, ladies, we're told to respect them unconditionally as we, as we are loved unconditionally. Um, because the fact is, you know, we, we do marriage by the Beatles. All you need is love. You heard that? All you need is love. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Plenty of marriages have got are dying, falling totally by the wayside, and they do love one another. But you need a lot more than love to, to make it in a marriage. Um, here's, here's where this cuts against the grain. Because do you realize that um, marriages were not always done according to love? In the scripture, most marriages were arranged by, by godly parents looking at another family and finding a suitable mate for their, their child or for their son. Or, uh, and you see this throughout the Old Testament. And there are still countries where this is practiced today. Because um, that it was... And then... Love is something that, it's a choice that's made. But today, what do we do? Well, we follow the, the stuff of Hollywood and romance, and we think that romance will get us through. Just recently, I was in a conversation with some pastors, and we were talking about marital romance, and one guy said, well, that don't last long. I mean, just being honest, the fact is... Uh, Romance is something that comes with feelings, and our feelings ebb and flow with time. But the fact is, when there is that rock-solid, unshakable commitment to one another, I'm going to be with you when I like being with you, and when I don't like being with you, when I feel like I love you, and when I don't, when I am selfish, and when I'm not, when I... When you don't look as good as the one down the road and when you, you know, all this kind of stuff. I mean, let me just be honest. I've, I've um, had young men come and sit in my office and say, Pastor, I met this beautiful girl and we can talk and we enjoy serving Christ together and she's a wonderful cook and she makes me feel this way and that way and, and I just I just I think I want to marry her and I say okay young man let me get 
industry. You want to marry this uh, young girl because she basically meets all your selfish, um, self-centered desires. No, that's not at all what it says. That's exactly what you just told me. She's beautiful. She's, she can cook. You can talk. You can communicate. You just, all these things. What, ha what happens when you can't talk anymore? What happens when communication just kind of goes out the window? Where do you go? What happens? She's beautiful. What happens when Satan sends along somebody a little more beautiful? And he will. Um, she can cook. What about when uh, she gets to a place where she doesn't cook quite as well? What if uh, you're in a car accident and you walk away from it without a scratch and your wife is, uh, is uh, paralyzed and all she can do is lay there and gurgle? Where are you going to go?